thanks Randy and thanks to Papua Museum for uh, having me and inviting me tonight. Um, yeah, I, Randy already introduced me perfectly, so I won't say anything more about myself. Um, I um, worked in Nepal in 2003. You can hear me at the back, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I was in Nepal in 2003 with a Canadian photographer called Steve Sanford, who still lives in Thailand today. Some of you, some of you will know him. And we were doing a bunch of stories. Uh, it was at the height of the civil war in Nepal at the time when the Maoists were challenging the um, the government. And uh, me and Steve crossed the front line twice and spent a week with the Maoists running after them in the mountains and then came back to Kathmandu uh, just before Christmas 2003 and um, we were still looking for other stories um, because if you fly from Bangkok to, to Nepal and stay there for three weeks to, to do just one story you're not going to make any money so we were fishing around and we we did a story about witchcraft, and we did another story about people who walked across the Himalayas from Tibet into Kathmandu, refugees. And I had a fixer, a guy called Gunaraj, and he um, came to me one day and he said, Oh, um, Charles Abraj has just been arrested. And he's in jail, in the city jail in, in Kathmandu, in central Kathmandu. And um, I went, can I meet him? And he went, I'll talk to the Home Office and I'll get back to you tomorrow. And the next day the Home Office gave us permission to go to the jail. So I didn't really interview him twice. We went to the jail and uh, just before Christmas 2003 and we met him first very briefly. The jail, uh, the city jail in Kathmandu in 2003 was straight out of a spaghetti western. It had like arches with big iron bars and watchtowers with guys with AK standing there patrolling up and down. It was really like in a total kind of movie field. And we were herded into this visitor center. There was maybe 30, 40 other people already in there. And you had to sit down on a concrete bench and there was a wall in front of you and above the wall was a chicken wire that went all the way to the ceiling. And so on that side were all the, the prisoners, the inmates of the, of the prison and on this side were the relatives and because they had to sit down and the prisoners they all came in shackled at the uh, at the hands and the feet and so the prisoners would all stand in a row like this and then and then the families would shout at them essentially so it was like this totally insane cacophony in there like maybe 30 different families shouting to their relatives who were like this behind behind the chicken wire and so we're sitting there and waiting and then he showed up uh, in a kind of Guantanamo Bay orange jumpsuit, not the, quite the same orange, but more like a Toscana kind of color. And um, he was also shackled at the hands and the feet. And um, we talked for 10 minutes. He wanted to find out, obviously he wanted to know who we were and who we were working for. And I was on assignment with Steve for the uh, Far Eastern Economic Review, which is a magazine that now no longer exists. So I just told him, oh, we're here for the Far Eastern Economic Review and we'd like to talk to you as you're going to trial soon um, about what you have to say about your arrest. And he went, yes, 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 I'll talk to my lawyer, come back next week. And so we left and then waited for his call via our fixer. Um, very close to the city jail in, in Kathmandu is um, Freak Street which is, in the 1970s, is where all the, the hippies stayed in cheap guest houses for a few rupees and smoked tons of dope and hung out. And this is where Charles Obraj also found his two vic the two people he, certain he definitely murdered in Kathmandu. Um, so we went around Freak Street, and in Freak Street I met a guy called Ganesh KC. So Ganesh KC, is a police officer at the central police station in Durba Square. This is the central square in Kathmandu. And when Ganesh KC was 10 years old, he uh, was a kid and he grew up in Bhaktapur, which is a city in the Kathmandu Valley next to Kathmandu. And one morning, very early in the morning, he was alone behind his parents' house, running into the paddy fields. In those days, there were still paddy fields between Kathmandu and Bhaktapur. Today, it's all concrete. But So he's running there. And he saw a group of people standing there in the, in the morning fog, and he went up to them, 10 years old, and they'd found a body. 
They found a charred, burned body with a plastic bag over its head. And it was a couple of policemen, local cops that had just been called in, and some local people who were standing there going, what is this? It turned out that this was one of the victims of Charles Abraj, because what he used to do is, when he no longer had any use for his victims, he would, so he would poison them for the most part slowly, and when he no longer had any use for them, he would burn them, but he would put a bag over their head so that the head would stay intact, so that they were easily identified. That was his shtick. That's what he did. That's what he did here, and that's what he did in, in Kathmandu. So, little 10-year-old Ganesh, he saw this, ran home to his parents, and went, Ah, oh, Baba, I've just seen a dead guy. Well, it was actually a lady, but I've never seen her. And, um, and then, as he grew older, he had this ambition. He found out that it was Charles O'Brien who did the killing, and he eventually became a policeman, which is why he's in this story. And um, when he became a policeman, he said to his wife, my ambition in life as a policeman is to arrest Charles Sobraj. And he did. And in the, as you may remember in the Netflix series, towards the end, in the last part, he's actually featured in the program. He's this very handsome, tall Nepali guy with a mustache and a really neat uniform. He's the arresting officer in the show. In reality, he's a rather small, quite corpulent man who looks nothing like the, the movie star who played him. But anyway, so I, I had a long talk with him in Freak Street, and then a few days later, we, uh, we got the okay first from the Home Office, and then from Charles Abraj, lawyer, that he was interested in talking to us. Um, the condition of all of that was uh, we were, Steve was not allowed to bring his camera, um, I was not allowed to record, and I was not allowed to even take any notes. I was not allowed to even have a pen. So everything I had to memorize. Whatever happened in there, I had to memorize. Um, when my fixer Gunaraj told me that we had access to Charles Abraj, I knew who he was. Because when I traveled in India in the early 90s, uh, in, in, uh, in, in the tourist flesh pots of South Asia, in places like Manali, or in Pushka, or in Goa, the, the backpackers and travelers who were there, they were often talking about this guy. And they were always telling these tall tales about amazing escapes from prison, and how he'd faked uh, an appendicitis and had gotten out one day, and how he was in the notorious Tiha jail in the 1970s and 80s in, uh, in Delhi, where you interviewed him. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, and how he uh, he had this modus operandi where he um, had a kind of comfortable lifestyle in Tiha jail, and then after ten years he escaped. He, I think, either poisoned the guards or he escaped because he would have been released shortly after, and he would have been extradited to Thailand. And as some of you may know after he did his murdering here, the police actually caught him and let him go because they said it was bad for the image of the country to arrest this man. So they let him go. And he came back once more to Thailand after that. So um, always under fake passports, of course, but it wouldn't have been such a stretch to, to grab him. Um, so I think, so the story goes that when he, he escaped after 10 years in jail in India because he didn't want to risk the extradition back to Thailand, because the Thais were understandably pissed off that they'd let him go in the first place, and maybe would have killed him in the airport or whatever, but he, if he'd come back here, it would have been a massive problem. So what he did, he went to Goa and uh, bought himself a gun and shot in the air a couple of times and had himself rearrested on a gun charge, which in, that, in those days in India was very, very serious because people, certainly foreigners, didn't have shotguns. So he sat another 10 years, and then in 1997, um, he got out and went to France. So all of this, so when I was in India first in the early 90s, right, 93, 94, I heard these stories of his amazing escapes again and again. And what was curious now, when I think about it now, is that nobody talked about the fact that this guy was a vicious murderer. Everybody talked about the fact that he was so amazing for having escaped the police so many times. 
And so that was quite curious. That was the perspective at the time anyway. Um, so yeah, so we went back uh, a week later. I won't go too much into the history of Charles Obrage because you can all get that from Wikipedia. And I guess if you've seen The Serpent, then you're vaguely familiar with at least part of the story. Um, so on our second visit, it was the same routine. We were led into this room with the chicken wire, and um, he came in again. It was not as busy that time. Maybe they kept some people out because he came in the second time. He was uh, shackled with the hands and the feet, um, and he had three guards with him, and they put two guards next to me. We still had to shout because it was this big, echoey, horrible, cold room. So we still had to shout at each other, and I think I think I shook his hand when he first came in, so through the wire, which I didn't enjoy. But um, and and then you know we started talking, and um, Charles Abraj speaks several languages. Um, I think we started off in French, but my French is okay, but it's not super good, and Steve is a English speaking Canadian, my, my partner, so I said, can we please switch to English? And um, how to describe that? So he was 58 years at that time. He probably hadn't killed anyone for 20 years, um, but we don't know, right? Um, he was self-confident, Despite, he looked a little bit ruffled. I mean, he was in the Toscana color jumpsuit and his hair was not, it was like, a, like he'd just woken up. He looked a bit like that. And uh, he told us that he had a cell for himself and he managed to get himself a sleeping bag. It was, it was December, Kathmandu in December is quite cold at night. And um, he, had a get, he had some sort of ghetto blaster, I think. And he had also, he had access to email through his lawyer. The lawyer is another story, which I'll hopefully get to in a minute. Another crazy story, but um, so you know he was first to break the ice. He was telling us a little bit about the conditions. Uh, Two thousand people in one block, uh, of course, you know, cramped, developing world, exaggerately only in prison conditions. Uh, many, many men in in one room, and and you know, the food is bloody awful. If you don't have money, you're going to starve in there. And all, all those kind of stories. He was describing the prison life. He was saying it's so archaic here. I can't believe I've ended up in here. And he kept saying, and in three months, I'll be out. I'll be free. I'll be a free man. I'll show them, because I'm innocent. The three guys, the three guards who were behind him, they all spoke English. And the two guys, which is, you know, it's not the usual prison guards. Not, it wasn't the usual Nepali prison guards. These guys behind me and behind him, they were there because He'd been arrested two months earlier. His, his case was going to court. He hadn't been tried yet. He was, just in, he was just sitting to wait for his court case. So I think that the guards were trying to glean some confessional details from him during this conversation. And I think in retrospect, because I was the only journalist allowed in there, and I'm the last journalist to talk to him, I think. So I assume that the Home Ministry gave the permission in order, right from the start, they planned to listen in because they were trying to find more evidence against him because he was before conviction. That didn't help them, though. Um, the first thing he really did after, after the introductions, the second time, um, he, he asked me a couple of personal questions. He said, are you married? And where's your wife? And, and um, so, you have this middle-aged man who is ethnically half Vietnamese and half Indian. His father was an Indian textile merchant. His mother was a Vietnamese woman who then divorced the textile merchant and married an officer of the French army. This is, of course, during the days when Saigon was still French, which is why Charles Abrage has a French passport, because of the marriage of his mother to a French officer. And she took him, when, when the officer's gig in Vietnam was finished, they went back to France, and by the age of 14, he, 
I think he was not loved at all. And by the age of 14, he was doing robberies and burglaries, and he was in and out of hostels, uh, young offenders institutions. And um, as I remember, by the age of 16, he went back to Vietnam to look for his father, who didn't want anything to do with him. So it was like rejection all the way throughout his childhood and youth, which is no excuse for killing loads of people, but may explain why he became the weirdo he became. Um, so when I was sitting there talking to him, it, it was really strange. He, um, he, if this man told me that he was an Indian textile merchant, I would have believed him. If he told me that he was a French academic, I would have believed him. And if he told me that he was an, an Indian uh, Vietnamese bureaucrat, I would have believed him. He had this ability, he had these three, at least three personalities in him, and he had this ability to switch between them very quickly, depending on what he thought the person he's speaking to would expect. So, to the effect that he could then manipulate that person. That was his whole shtick, that's what he did. He, and in that sense, um, he's not too dissimilar to other people I've spoken to, like the Dalai Lama, or like um, CEOs from big companies I've interviewed. Um, it's this interpersonal skill. He has, he's really good at this, where he, um, he kind of goes, not physically, of course, goes, uh, he did that later, but he goes towards people in this, um, it's just like when you meet, yeah, when, when you meet people who are in the public eye and they, you have a very brief window of time, or they have a very brief window of time for you, but in that window of time, they are entirely focused on you. And they make you feel uh, special and positive. And he had that ability. It didn't work with me because I was well prepared, but I could see that um, if, if, if Charles O'Brien met a random person in the street or in a bar or in a cafe or something and employed those techniques, you'd be his best friend in 15 minutes. He's, he had that very easy, and you know, he's obviously erudite, speaks many languages, and you know, because he's a crim, he, he knows lots of tricks, and, and so it was easy for him to impress these young backpackers that he then later murdered. Um, so that's what he tried to do with me and Steve. Steve was sort of, we, I'd prepared a list of questions, I had it in my head. Steve was just sitting there, obviously he couldn't use the camera. Um, and um, yeah, we were just, I kept saying to him, look, Mr. Sobraj, we're here for the Far Eastern Economic Review. We're not here to, to tell you about our lives. You're the important guy, so you please tell us what happened. And um, he went into this about the whole injustice that occurred to him. So in, in 1997, he was finally released from jail in India. He went back to France. He was in France for six years. He tried to sell his life story as a Hollywood script. He charged horrendous amounts of money to journalists uh, who wanted to interview him. I think some French media like Le Monde paid like a thousand bucks or more to, to talk to him. Um, so he, you know, he behaved like a celebrity in France, but in the end, the, the sale of the script to Hollywood never happened because, God, he's a serial killer, you know, who's going to buy a, who's going to give a guy like that money, you know, even in this world. Maybe today they would, but, <laughs> but in those days, it, it didn't happen. And so in September 2003, he was suddenly back in Nepal. And Nobody knows why. I asked him, and he said, I came, no. What he said to me is, this is my first time in Nepal. I've never ever been here before. And I've come here to make a documentary about handicrafts. But I know he told somebody else that he came to start a mineral water bottle factory or something like that. So he had like a few crazy stories. But it's not clear why he came back. In any case, he went to the Yak and Yeti, that's the number one hotel in Kathmandu, and he went to the casino and gambled and, you know, large, large around the casino, and after two or three days, uh, a young 
journalist from the Himalayan Times recognized him and started photographing him and just started following him around and then phoned the police and they nicked him and they, they arrested him and then what I assume happened, I have no direct evidence of that, is that once he was arrested, uh, the French government, because he's a French passport holder, probably phoned the Nepali government and said, great, keep him. Because he was still a liability, even at 58. He, he didn't know what he was going to do next. So um, the reason why I'm saying this, I'm not just inventing this, after we met him, there is an Interpol office in Kathmandu and we were invited to go to the Interpol office and we met the case officer who was liaising between the French government and the Nepali government and he had this big file on his desk and we went, ah, oh, we'd really like to look at that file and, and Steve, yeah, so I took the case officer for a cup of tea <laughs> and Steve sat in the office and as soon as I was outside with, with the case officer, Steve got his camera out opened the file and started shooting everything. He got everything. And it, he got all the pictures of the victims and the guy must have known, you know, they're not that stupid. He just, they just went, okay, this journalist, he's going to get the photos and then for some reason the story will be out. Um, but this is, this happened after the visit. So during the visit, um, as I said, he tried to constantly turn the tables and involve me or ask me personal questions and they, they came from all directions. He was quite subtle. You know, we would be talking about something, some aspect of life in Asia and then he would say, and how do you do it? And all, so every time he did that, I just blocked him and said, Mr. Sobraj, we're here for you. We're not here for me. It's, I'm not interesting at all. You are the guy, um, you are the guy my readers want to hear about. So we tried to flatter him and all the time we had this weight of these guards on top of us who were, maybe they were recording, but this is the 2003, I don't think anybody in Nepal was recording anything. They were just trying to listen in and um, to, to see if he would confess or implicate himself. And he didn't. I mean, in the whole hour he talked about, he never talked about the particular murders that happened in Nepal. But he did quote from both his biographies. Uh, there's two really good books which I recommend to all of you. Uh, one is by a guy called Richard Neville. It's called The Life and Times of Charles Abraj. Uh, Richard Neville was an Australian journalist who was one of the founders of Oz magazine, which was a, a contrary, uh, rude 1960s kind of hippie freak magazine in the UK that got taken to court for obscenity. Germain Greer was a contributor. So, Richard Neville, for some reason, after he did Oz Magazine, became interested in Charles Abraj and wrote this book with a female, with another female Australian journalist whose name I don't recall. And then, some years after, another book came out called Serpentine. Um, that one I read after I did the interview and it gave me nightmares for two weeks. Um, it's written by an American journalist and he kind of fictionalized the story a little bit, but it's really, really scary. It's totally edge of the sea stuff. So if you manage to get hold of that book, that's, I, for me, that was the best text about him, that long text that's been written. Um, so he wouldn't implicate himself, but he told tall tales about his life, but he always skirted around the actual killings any of the killings, not just the ones in the park. So I, I, no matter at which angle I came at him, how I asked him, he, you know, he was really on the ball and he, he was not going to say anything that would endanger him. And as I said earlier, he repeated several times, uh, the wheels of justice here are archaic. There is zero evidence that I've ever been to this country before. Uh, they're saying, I stayed here in a hotel under an assumed name. And then he said something really funny. He said, why would I do that? I'm Charles Sobraj. <laughs> so th that was his thing. He, he played on his notoriety without admitting to his notoriety. And, you know, apparently that, that worked for him for years and years and years. I thought, when I was in school, when I was 16, uh, I went to a, 
a grammar school in Germany, and there was about 2,000 students. And um, every now and then, a pastor used to come to this school, a Quaker. And for some reason, um, the area where I grew up was Protestant, but I didn't like the Quakers. The Quakers were considered like a cultish sort of Jehovah's Witnesses type of, type of gang, you know. So this guy would come to the school and try and recruit kids into his Quaker sermons. And his modus operandi, years later, when I was talking to Sobraj, I thought, I've met this guy before. This, he seemed like, because he's so self-confident, and, and because it's all about him and the cult around him. Um, he, and because he has these incredible people's, interpeople skills that I described earlier, which are similar to politicians, he, you know, he tried to make his most persuasive case that he could, although he knew that we didn't believe a word he said. That's, I mean, it's kind of obvious. It's Charles Abrad, we're in prison with him. He's, you know, he's notorious for 25 years, and here's two journalists. They're not going to believe him that he's innocent. It's ridiculous to think that. But nonetheless, that's how he played it. And, of course, he played for the gallery of guards around us. Um, so he kept, So at that time, um, he was accused of killing, and I'm really sorry I don't remember the name of the victims right now, but he was accused of killing two backpackers in Freak Street. And um, the only evidence that the, that the Nepali government had was a faked signature in a, in a hotel logbook from 1972 and 1973. Um, in Nepal, all the guest houses, they have these huge ledgers, and when you sign in, you have to put your passport and your name and your address and your gender and your age and a hundred other things, and then you have to sign at the end. And they still had that from the 70s. There, there, there was no other records. Of course, there was no computers. Even in 2003, there was barely any computers there. So they had really, at the end of the day, <coughs> Had he been a normal criminal, there, there would have been no way to convict him on what they had. They would have had to let him go. Um, they had that one signature which put him on that date into that hotel, and then he jumped the bill and left the country. And it was, uh, this was after the murders. And they were going to convict him on the strength of that. He knew that, and he told us, this is not evidence. I've never been here before. They've got no chance and in three months I'll be back home in France. That was basically his mantra. That's what he wanted us to convey to the world. Um, of course that didn't happen. So after an hour and a half of talking to three different people in the form of one person, uh, we were told by the guards that we had to leave, and I think I shook hands with him again. And he didn't say, is he on the outside, but he said something like that. And I remember walking out of the city jail, and um, there was quite a bunch of, uh, there was a small group of Charles Branch groupies outside the prison. These were young Americans uh, who um, traveled from the US to see a serial killer. They went to visit him every day. So I thought, I'll interview them as well while I'm at it, you know? And I, I went up to the first guy and I said, so if Mr. Sobraj is released in a couple of months, um, would you go and have dinner with him? And they all went, yeah, too right, we'll pay him his dinner. And I went, okay. And uh, then I said, well, why do you think he killed all those people? And one of the guys said, Asking why Charles Abraj kills is like asking why the sky is blue. And that seemed to be, um, yeah, this kind of typically sycophantic thing that sometimes happens around serial killers. Um, I think there are other examples as well where they get fans and followers. And, and he had his little gang there outside the prison, and I suppose, for the length of their stay. It, it is possible to go and see a prisoner every day if you, you can bring them some food, and obviously you can't do an interview like we did, but if you just want to see a prisoner in Kathmandu jail, you can just go. And I guess all those young, it was all men, by the way, um, all those young guys from the US, 
they just spent their holidays hanging out with Charles Abroad. Two-week holiday in Kathmandu with a serial killer. I mean, what more could you possibly want in life? Um, so, most of the time in life, I feel a little bit like an outsider in general. Maybe because I write, I spend a lot of time by myself, uh, maybe because of what I've seen. But I always feel like a little bit not part of the gang. And I remember so distinctly walking out of this Sergio Leone jail. And right next to City Jail in Kathmandu is a road called New Road, which is the main shopping street in Kathmandu, the Sukhumvit Road of Kathmandu. And um, the interview finished maybe at six or seven, and there was like a million people doing their shopping. It was like crazy, crazy, crazy busy. You couldn't drive a car through there, like a rock festival. And I remember walking through there, having just been in this jail, and thinking, I'm really part of this, because that guy is really part of nothing. Charles Obraj, he wasn't like many serial killers, it wasn't a sex thing, he didn't particularly murder women, he murdered anything that walked past him. Um, essentially, I mean he must have liked it I suppose, but essentially he killed people for their money and their passports, and so he would entrap them, poison them, kill them for their money and passports, and then move on to the next victim. And that worked for five, six years until he got finally trapped in India, where he tried to poison, in 1976, a large group of French students, and um, they realized, because it, it was too many, he tried to poison 20 people at the same time, and um, uh, they realized what was happening to them, and they wrestled him to the ground and called the Indian police, and that's how he was then eventually caught and then convicted and then put in Tihar jail, from which he didn't emerge again until 1997. So what I wanted to say was that um, it's a weird thing. The, the moment when I was standing in New Road, surrounded by these millions and millions of shoppers, evening shoppers, I, I had this, there was this real moment of positivity and having faith in humanity. And before then and since then, I've, I've interviewed some other really bad people. Most of them were in uniform. But, um, because when you're in uniform, you can do what the fuck you want and no one will ever care. But every now and then, you meet like a person, at least in our job, um, where the clothes don't fit. It's happened to me three, four times. I, I once interviewed um, a young Cambodian guy who then turned out to be a cannibal. <laughs> and um, he was like that too. There was something not quite right about this person and even though he was wearing smart clothes, they didn't fit. And I would say, in my limited ex experience of such people, Charles Obraj was very much that and if, you know, we can have long discussions about who should be in prison and who should not be in prison and, you know, in some countries they they arrest somebody if he smokes a joint or does this or does that, but I think prisons are really, really built for men like that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm against capital kind of punishment, but there is absolutely no reason, even that short, short meeting of just an hour and a half, I could really feel that there is no reason to let this man out ever again. Okay, so since then, he got convicted twice more. He got married to the daughter of his lawyer. The, the daughter of the lawyer then became a kind of celebrity herself and went on to Big Brother India. Just as, yes, just as the wife of Charles Abraj. She, that was her celeb status and she went on to Big Brother India, but she didn't last very long. She got wanted out real quick. And um, so he lingered and then he got a heart problem. He had a double bypass some years ago. Uh, in 2014, he was reconvicted for another murder to extend the life sentence. And then when COVID hit in 2019, sorry, 2020, um, the Nepali government um, offered a general amnesty to all prisoners below 75. And at that time, I remember talking to some people here, there, people were really worried that he would be out, despite the fact that he's very old now, 78 years old, 
Uh, people are still frightened of him. The families of his victims are, of course, still traumatized. And Mr. Knippenberg, the guy uh, from the Dutch embassy who really helped catch him here in Bangkok, and others were really not impressed that he would come back out. And I wasn't impressed either. But then the Nepali government did a U-turn. They let everybody over 75 out, but they kept him. So today, um, he's still in city jail in Kathmandu. Um, there's no chance for parole. I hear that he's in bad health. Um, and so in that respect, I just wanted to very briefly talk about the Netflix series, um, which I thought was okay, but for me, I couldn't quite relate it to the encounter I had with him. Um, there was a disconnect. I'm not saying that the program was bad or anything. I'm just saying that there was a disconnect of standing in a room with that man and then seeing him played by an actor 20 years later. It's, it's, that for me didn't work, but I talked to a few people tonight who watched it recently and they really liked it. So. And it has great scenes of, of Bangkok in those days, but um, I was wondering whether perhaps I asked myself two questions about that. One is, shouldn't they have waited till he's dead? Because obviously the, the families of the at least 12 victims, there may be many more, uh, they are obviously still in shock after all these years. And to see that story commercialized, I don't know what they think about it. Um, it could be sensitive um, and it could trigger people to relive all that horrible experience again. I don't know. So I felt it might have been more appropriate to make a documentary rather than, than, a, than a series with a fictionalized series with actors. But that's what they did, and you know, to some extent, that's why I'm here. Because otherwise, if it hadn't been for the Netflix series, I think Mr. Sobraj would have slowly, slowly, slowly faded into obscurity and would have lost his strange celebrity status. <clears throat> I, I remember talking to Indian families in the 1990s when he was in Tihar jail and they used to tell me, when our kids are naughty in the evenings and don't want to go to bed, we tell them Charles Sobraj will come and eat them. <laughs> so that shows you how much of a household name he was, that parents would tell their children Every kid in India knew who that guy was. He was, you know, to uh, paraphrase John Lennon, he was bigger than Jesus. And um, that would have definitely, you know, India's got other problems. And if, if the guy is no longer there, then he will go out of the public consciousness. And if, if he hadn't been revived by Netflix, I think there would have been the two books, which were written in the 90s, and then it, he would have slowly died in obscurity. Now, I guess there will be one more story when he eventually passes away, it will be a top headline. And I, I really hope that they're not gonna let, let him out because as I said, I felt he's probably too old to kill people, but um, he should probably not, I mean, it's not for me to judge at the end of the day, it's the, it's the Nepali state that judges, but it's, there's no point letting this man into the human, back into the human community, it would only be more trouble. So, in conclusion, I think he just killed to pay the bills. There is no greater reason than that. And what a pathetic reason that is, because actually the money he got from people in the 1970s, these backpackers, they didn't have a lot of money. They had maybe a thousand bucks or something in their pocket. And they had a, a passport, which in those days, of course, was very easy to, to change. You just take the picture out and write something else on top. And that's how he managed to get procure endless amounts of passports. But it was, at the end of the day, it was a, a small con. He wasn't ever going to get rich from any of this. It's, um, so it's, it's hard to see what, what the guy was thinking, thinking because eventually he must have known that he will get, get caught. caught. He can only do that. that. Even, Even in those, those days, days with lax rules, no visas, dodgy passports, eventually the cops are going to catch up with you if you keep killing young people. And that's exactly what happened. And um, yeah, I, you know, he had a double bypass, I think, three, four years ago. 
and he's lying in a damp Nepali prison cell in the middle of winter, so I can't imagine that he's going to do that many more rounds. But then he's a tough guy, so you know. So um, thanks very much. If you have any questions, now is the time. If you want to ask me anything, just not about the exact dates and history, because that's all we need. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. The first moment you encountered him, did you find him charismatic? I yes. Mean, I mean, did you, did you think like, oh, this, this guy couldn't have killed anybody? He, no. Yeah. You see, you said by the end of the meeting, he was like one of these guys who can't wear his clothes. Yes. I mean, he was wearing a funny jumpsuit and he was shackled when he came in. And as I said, he looked like he'd just gotten out of bed. He was kind of disheveled and his hair was standing in different directions. But he made an entrance. That's his thing. He's a performer. Yeah. And maybe he doesn't even know who he is as a real person. But when he's in, at least with me, when he was in the public mode, he was putting on a performance. Hey, I'm Charles O'Brien. And he had that swagger. Very, very but, but, but you, you, you could feel it wasn't genuine. I mean, I, I guess I'm always curious about people that work people into things. And people see somebody like I read um, some girl like Charles Manson and the, the women who followed him. And they're, they're like these disturbed women, like suddenly they meet this guy and suddenly they feel so comfortable with him, they feel that he's like... Well, Charles Abrash did exactly the same. He had several yeah. women helping him and he persuaded them to help him um, uh, poison his victims. So they posed as nurses, he would poison them, then the nurse would take them somewhere. Hey, I take you to a room, I'll make you feel better and give them more poison. So very similar. But at, but at the beginning of the encounter, you didn't feel the same. Like this is actually like when you, your first feeling was like this is a nice guy. Or my first feeling. My first feeling. My first feeling when I started talking to him, as I said earlier, it's a bit like talking to other people. Other people in the public eye who are very good with interpersonal skills. When you're talking to the chicken wire, I mean, you're talking to the chicken wire how close were you to him? Us. Really? Okay, so you're still close to him in spite of the shouting. We had to shout. Yeah. But I had to sit, and yeah. he stood. So he was kind of towering over me as well. He was looking down at me and my friend Steve. Yeah. Another theory is that he was trying to start a family, so to speak, just like Manson. And these people that were killed were people that did not want to be part of his family. They rejected him. So maybe that fear of rejection kind of came from his childhood. Yeah, I, have you ever I mean, heard of that? No, but I wonder whether. Okay, I'm sure there's some people in this room who've had childhood trauma of various severities. Um, lots of people have childhood trauma, and in life, lots of horrible shit happens. There's always some, unless we're really, really lucky. There's always going to be some element of tragedy in everybody's life. As we grow up, we lose loved ones, we lose our friends, we. Maybe we get sick ourselves, whatever. None of this is an excuse to kill 20 people. So you can analyze and analyze and analyze. He did it for the cash. He was a vulgar guy. He was a clever guy, but he was a vulgar guy who did it for small money. And yes, he was really, really unloved by his parents and all of that. But, you know, I know other people who are unloved by their parents and they don't go around killing people. So that alone, I, I think it... it It'd be hard to find one particular reason that triggered that man to go through a lifetime of making other people's lives a total misery. Or it could be a combination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's likely to be a complex thing of contradictory reasons, yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry? Who were you looking for at the time? Uh, Barry's in the review, but the story came out. Let me just remember. I was working for. Um, this was kind of before the. Just before the internet got really strong. Yeah. So I was working. I had a. I had a syndication agent in the UK called Planet Syndication. They went bust two years later. But at that time, it was still working well. 
So we sent them that story, me and Steve, and it sold and sold and sold. In those days, before the internet, we could sell it. We sold it in Swedish, we sold it in Spanish, we sold it in French, we sold it like six, seven, eight different times to different magazines in different languages. Today, that was no longer Was this an exclusive just for you? Yeah. Or like, they didn't work like a lot of other interviews? He didn't give any interviews. After that, the police shut him down. That was it. So I was the last guy to interview him. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.